Hello, my name is Kavi Raz. You may remember me uh, as Lieutenant Singh from Star Trek The Next Generation, and you're listening to us on Track and Told. Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. On today's episode, we've got a rare interview with an actor named Kavi Raz, a veteran of the industry whose time in Trek may have been short, but his work outside of the franchise is known in his particular part of the industry. Kavi played Assistant Chief Engineer Singh in the Star Trek TNG first season episode, Lonely Among Us. It was a short one episode spot, and spoiler alert, his character didn't make it to the end of this one, but his list of credits and accomplishments goes far beyond wearing the Starfleet uniform. At a time when there wasn't much work for Indian actors in Hollywood, Kavi paved the way for his community with his troop of fellow performers showcasing authentic Indian plays with Indian voices. In addition to roles in shows like M.A.S.H., The A-Team, NYPD Blue, Crossing Jordan, Pet Cemetery, and others, he may be best known for his recurring role in Saint Elsewhere a first in Hollywood history as Dr. VJ Kochar, the first Indian actor to appear as a series regular on an American TV show. And that's a pretty huge accomplishment to be proud of. These days, Kavi continues to lay down the tracks for emerging Indian actors with his own production company and a new platform to give these voices a place to thrive. There's more than meets the eye with this actor, writer, director, and trailblazing entrepreneur, and I can't wait for you to hear his story. So today, we're headed to engineering to go warp speed with Kavi Raz. But before we get into this week's episode, I have to ask you, are you following Trek Untold on social media yet? You can find us over on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, all at Trek Untold, one word with no spaces. You can also become a Patreon supporter for this podcast over at patreon.com slash trekuntold. Here, you can directly contribute to keeping this show running at full power for as low as a few bucks a month. If you do this, you'll have early access to new episodes, the ability to ask future guests questions, check out exclusive merchandise, and other special benefits. We've also got an official merch store and an Amazon store filled with Star Trek goodies. So if you want to rock a Trek Untold t-shirt to the next con you're going to, or order something Star Trek related for yourself or someone else, please use the links in the show notes to help us help you. Shout out to our show sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. Maker is a fine 3D printed Star Trek inspired toys and accessories for collectors of all kinds. But you'll hear more about them later on. Now without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Today's guest you might remember was a lieutenant in Star Trek, but outside of sci-fi as you're going to learn today, he is most definitely a captain. Kavi Raz, welcome to Trek Untold. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you today. Yeah, hopefully we have some fun. I think we will. Uh, we, we'll have some fun hopefully at some point, but I'm going to ask you a ton of probing questions. You're going to hate me by the <laughs> end. Uh, and let's let's kick that off right now, because I want to ask you, Kavi, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Were you a fan of the show growing up? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, growing up in England, actually. Um, okay. Uh, we would run home. The show would be on, I think it was 5 or 5.30 uh, uh, early evening. And we would run run home from the play, playing field. I, I played soccer and field hockey. And I was very active in that. And I would finish up the game, run home to make sure that we can catch the episodes. Yes. So that was like a regular after school thing for you guys. It, it was. It was just, and then we, then then the whole week we talked about what was on the episode and so on and exchanging notes with other, you know, other students, other kids who watched it. And yeah, it, it was pretty amazing. That's really fun. Now, I think you kind of just gave us a little bit of an answer to this next question here, but I'd love to learn a little bit more background about you, Kavi. Uh, can you tell us where you grew up, who your parents were, and what they did, and yeah. what Kavi wanted to be when he grew up? I, I was born in India, in Punjab, in a tiny village, um, um, population maybe three, 400 people, I guess. Wow. Um, yeah. That's like there. the size of one classroom here in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had no school in our, in our village, so we had to, as a kid, 
uh, we would walk across this ravine and go to the next village and that's where the school was. Uh, we used to sit on the floor on tarts and we didn't have any chairs and desks. So that's the kind of background I come from. Uh, very rural area, a farming community. And my father had served in the British India Army during Second World War. Um, and India was in the British rule until 1947. And then when uh, the British left, they, um, they invited a lot of the ex-officers who had served under them in various countries, particularly in India, because the officers in India spoke English, uh, to come to England and work. Huh. And so he came to England on a work visa, and then we as a family followed a year after. So I grew up in England. Wow. And um, yeah, and then I had a sister who who was who got married at a very young age and came to the United States. Uh, she married someone from here. Uh, and, uh, and they were farmers in Yuba City, which is a small town north of Sacramento. Then after a few years, we had the opportunity to come here. She sponsored us as a family and um, as uh, extended family relatives. And we came here on a on a um, um, family, I forgot the name of the visa we got. It was a, uh, and that's how we, my brother and I first came here, then uh, the rest of the family followed a few months later. Mm-hmm. And so most of my life has been here right in the United States. And that's a heck of a journey though, to go from yeah. one part of the world to another. It must be a pretty big culture shock also. That's a lot of different cultures. It was, I remember sitting in, in, in a chemistry class back in England. Uh, I had just graduated high school, so I started this, um, um, a college. Uh, I took some classes. I knew I was gonna. We were moving here, so I was just on a temporary basis. I was taking some classes, and I remember one of my teachers telling me, uh, "You're gonna have to learn a new language when you go to, when you go to the United States." And I was like, "What do you mean a new language? I speak English there." But then I realized, <laughs> uh, in a rural town, and I had a very heavy British accent at that time. Uh, in a rural town like Yuba City, um, no one could understand me. Hmm. And <laughs> uh, it was it was quite an experience, uh, it, it sort of simulating into a, a brand new culture and a brand new nation. I, I, I remember um, first time at a hamburger. It was the most amazing experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so those small things that that uh, made me an American, I guess, step by step. And I, I'm, I'm very proud and love being part of this this journey and and finally calling myself an American. Oh, that's great. That's such a cool journey. And I know as we'll talk during this interview, I mean, you definitely didn't leave anything behind, though. You brought a lot of home with you. And yeah. we'll talk about that as we go on. But I wanted to ask now, again, just kind of getting the origin story of you here, Kavi. Uh, when did acting kind of find its way into your life? Ah, um, I guess somewhere in, uh, I, I come from a sports background. I, I played soccer and hockey, field hockey. Um, field hockey at, at quite a high um, professional level, and I, I, I guess I was always I always found myself on on some sort of a stage. I loved the attention, loved being out there, uh, the admiration, um, 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 and and I think acting was just an extension of that. That as I as my my um, my my physical ability to play my sports kind of waned a little bit. And um, uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, uh, acting was always there. In England, I grew up in a small town called Lempton Spa. Um, and there was a, um, a, a theater there, a Shakespearean theater in town. And, and I'm, in England, we were so used to walking everywhere. It's a small town, we just walked everywhere. And I would always walk by this, this theater. Um, we, had, we had every Saturday, we had these hockey matches in various towns and I was a young kid. 14, 15, 13, 14, 15 years old. And I played in the senior team. And I would walk from my home on our main street, high street, to the end of it. And that's where we got picked up by the senior players uh, so we could travel to our location, our, our fields to play the game. And I would always walk by this theater. And I would see the, the, uh, the, the, the photographs, the pictures of the actors outside uh, in the window. And I would stay, stand there for like, like sometimes minutes, you know, 10, 15 minutes, just looking at them and in admiration of like, oh, would, would this be nice to get that kind of an attention to, to be part of something like that? But I guess I never had the courage uh, to, to give up other things and, and really pursue acting until I moved to the United States. I went to college, I graduated as an engineer and master's in industrial engineering. And then one day I decided, no, this is not for me. And I started studying acting, I joined a local, uh, uh, 
drama group in Hayward in near San, uh, this is near uh, San Francisco. That's that's where I went to school. And uh, finally decided one day I was actually working as an engineer. I was I was making really good money back then. And one day I just quit my job and said, no, this is not for me. Move to Los Angeles to pursue acting full time. And that's a huge risk to do because you're basically in a, a job that you're pretty secure and I would imagine too. I mean, that's a good I was job very, to have. Very secure, make, yeah, making really good money. And I, I come from a background where you don't do this kind of a thing. Mm. Uh, ethnic, you know, uh, Indian family, uh, uh, everyone expects you to be either a doctor or an engineer, especially back then. And um, my father was very supportive. My father, one of those forward thinking people, you know, ex-army officer, you know, go take the world, you know, make it your own journey, that kind of thinking. Very supportive on me, but the rest of the family wasn't. And my, 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 I have, I'm an older brother who was always very supportive, but the rest of the family, extended family, thought I was crazy, especially after graduating from college, making such good money and now pursuing something that's unthinkable and unimaginable and maybe, you know, uh, nothing in the end. <laughs> but I was relentless. Uh, no, this is what I want to do. <laughs> Let's put a timestamp on that too. Like, what year would you say that was that you decided to? Oh make God, uh, it makes me feel old now. But uh, this was uh, I moved to Los Angeles. I still remember the dates: six uh, December, nineteen seventy-six. Wow, just before Christmas. Yeah, bicentennial too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the reason why I want to get that time on that too is I think that's important to your story because 1976, there's not a lot of t of Indian actors walking around in Hollywood. I was the I was the very first one. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was the very first one. Um, and then, I mean, that was part of the I think the difficult sort of part of the journey as well. Being the first one, they didn't take the only impression in Hollywood of Indian actors was through Bollywood, and whatever little um, uh, uh, sort of awareness of Bollywood there was. And Bollywood actors weren't really looked upon as great actors at that time. It was, now they're, they're improved quite a lot, but they it was over the top acting and you know, there's this, this uh, almost um, Bodwellian type of, a, I don't know, it was a very different sort of approach. And I would hear that a lot. And, uh, and, and, and it was really difficult being accepted as an Indian actor trying to pursue a career in Hollywood. Do you remember what your very first professional gig was in Hollywood? Um, uh, at St. Elsewhere. St. Elsewhere was the first one, okay. Yeah, St. Elsewhere was, uh, I actually, this is really funny. I actually did my first gig was actually a Bollywood film <laughs> with one of the biggest stars of that time, um, uh, Sanjeev Kumar and Shavana Azmi. Shwana Azmi is, 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 is still very excellent. Jeep Mort passed away several years ago. Uh, one of the top stars of Bollywood at that time. This was a film being shot in Los Angeles. And they, need, they needed a, um, a villain, <laughs> a young villain. And that's what I played in the Bollywood film. My first gig was that. And um, it's funny that years later, um, about four five, I had the opportunity to direct Shwana Azmi, who was the main female lead in that film. And I was directing her on film, and she didn't remember a thing about that film. She didn't. She didn't remember me, but and I never mentioned this. One. <laughs> I pretended like it never happened. <laughs> it's kind of funny though. You basically, you know, you left India, you left England, you're in America now, and India comes right back to you. <laughs> it does. I. I. It's just funny. full circle. I, yeah, full circle. I, I go back quite a bit. I. I now direct. Um, um, what I would say, Bollywood films. They're actually regional films, Punjabi films. Uh, that's the part of India I come from, from uh, Punjab, and I speak the language. Even though I left uh, India when I was like seven or eight years old, I, I, I'm quite fluent in the language. Uh, so I direct these films, Punjabi films, which is a, a growing cinema in India. And um, um, yeah, so I, I, it's really full circle. And I always say I'm, I'm, I'm a part of three different cultures, and none of them ever wants to leave me. And I, they keep drawing me back. Uh, I go to England quite a bit, and um, yeah. Uh, and I feel comfortable in all three places. I call USA my home, my nation, my country. Uh, my heart is here, uh, but I can I can fit in when I go to England or, or India. That's very cool. Now, I think this was in this timeline here. You can help me out with this, Kavi. Uh, I read that you started a theater company that brought Indian plays to American stages. I think that would have been around this time period too, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about uh, that. I, what happened was I, I was in an acting class and... Um, I had this teacher, Hedy Sontag. Hedy was uh, one of those um, uh, contract players at, at, I believe, at Warner Brothers at one time. And when the, all the contracts started going out of fashion, so to speak, she started teaching acting. 
a wonderful teacher, very well learned teacher. Um, and and I, I was I was taking acting class. This was Lee Strasberg, and um, uh, not quite knowing a direction in life. So I always had this sort of a I was learning, I was doing things, but what do I do with it? So she started talking to me one day. She said, "Do you?" She said, "Have you ever read Rabindranath Tagore?" Rabindranath Tagore was a poet laureate from India, uh, who had, he has written a lot of poetry, plays, and uh, novels and novelettes. Um, um, so I, I said, "No, I have not, but I know of him." She said, "Go read him." So I went to the library, local bookstore. I, uh, our school was on on Hollywood Boulevard, and Hollywood Boulevard at that time had a lot of these huge bookstores that like three, four story tall. And, and I, I was an avid reader, loved reading. And so I went, checked out, every, bought every book I could, checked out every book on a minute to go from U, UCLA Library, USC, U, UCLA, uh, and, and Los Angeles Central Library. And I had like table full of books and I started reading it. And I found some of these plays were fascinating. So I started doing a print together, got some actors together, started rehearsing his plays and went out looking for a theater. Uh, Richmond Shepherd, who was a, a mime, um, um, well-known mime, he had a theater on, on Santa Monica Boulevard. I convinced him to let me use this stage to stage one of my plays uh, for nothing. <laughs> so I, was, I was very enterprising. Yeah. And so, so we, found, we never had a theater. So we formed this, I formed this theater company called The Wandering Players. And a very uh, appropriate name because we had no theater of our own. So we would, I would just go put on a play, rehearse, and go look for a theater where I could stage it. And, and I, was, I was pretty good at it. <laughs> well, that's some amazing drive and ambition too, because that's you know, yeah. still pretty early in your career in LA and you're out there. Very early. Hustling. This is again, knowing nothing about the business, no, 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 no direction, no one to guide me, no one to tell me what to do. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would put on these plays um, and then I would print these, uh, the flyers, I would make the flyers myself, go get copies printed. And I would stand on Hollywood Boulevard handing out these flyers to people to come and see my plays. And that's the, I had no money, so that's the only way I could convince people. And, you know, if I if I talk to a thousand people, maybe two will show up. Uh, so the audience will break, because they have a lot of tourists and stuff. And But it was it was also the fun and the most uh, invigorating or the most, I would say, um, um, uh, enlightening period of my, 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 my life as well. Because I was doing things on my own, on my own thinking, on my own planning and learning a lot learning a lot about the industry as well as about my own life. And that's a very admirable trait and something really special to have when you're in LA in that time period, really. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you were really doing a ton of stuff there. And I want to come back to another show that you did, uh, which is MASH. I know you did an episode of MASH. That was a pretty important one for you. Uh, can you tell me any memories you have from working on that set? Yeah, it was, it was just a lot of fun, I remember. Uh, I almost didn't do that because I was doing St. Elsewhere at the same time. Uh, some or there was a little bit of a gap and I can't remember what happened. Either we were off or... I just wasn't shooting that week. I, I, I can't remember that. And MASH came along. It was, it was literally offered to me. I went in and, 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 and auditioned. And it wasn't even much of an audition. It was just, they just gave me the, uh, the episode. They offered this to me. And it was just a lot of fun. And it was, it was the first, it was the third episode from the last. And it was the first episode that was being shot on stage. Their set, which was, um, um, I think, in the San Monica Mountains, burned down. Hmm. The, the set was completely destroyed. And so they built the set at 20th Century Fox on stage. So this was the, the one that I was in, was the first show on the stage. So everyone was kind of learning to get their way around the stage to, to brand new set that wasn't, it was much like what they had, but it wasn't the same thing. So there was a lot of little stumbling blocks. I remember that when they were shooting and, and, and uh, you know, when, when you're on set shooting a show, you get used to a certain camera angle and stuff. It just, you, know, you don't think about it, just, just, just done. So they were a brand new set, trying to get used to it at the same time. But there was just a complete lot of fun. I remember table reading where we had champagne on the table. Wow, uh, table, that's a table, table reading. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't drink at that time. But it was, and I was trying to pretend like, trying to fit in. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you mentioned it, I feel like we got to start talking about this too, because St. Elsewhere was like a big deal for you. You were Dr. Uh, DJ Kochar for several years in the show there. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially we're talking early 80s here to see an Indian man on television in a recurring role. That is honestly pretty newsworthy even today. Uh, so yeah. I'd love to hear yeah. any, any of your thoughts about your time working on St. Elsewhere. 
Oh, I learned a lot. I mean, all these great, amazing actors, uh, William uh, uh, Will Daniels and uh, so many. Um, for me, I was so naive, so new. I, I didn't know anything about the industry. Uh, I had trained as an actor, but when you're in real situation, it's a whole different experience. You can learn all you want, but then you now you're up against all these amazing actors. Right. Uh, so each day was really a, a classroom for me, and I absorbed it all. I, 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 it was, I was just, I was just there, trying to be part of all this, this, this wonderful journey that I, I was, I, I, I consider myself very lucky, blessed that I got that opportunity. Now, it's interesting too to kind of think about that era of Hollywood because again, Indian actors, it's still very much a rarity, and at that point. You know, I, I can't think of too many really positive representations of it. Like I think of like Peter Sellers doing impersonations, uh, <laughs> folks, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah. for you, especially like I believe your MASH character, he was doing yoga. He's doing like headstands and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> the doctor you're playing, he's a doctor. That's kind of like a stereotype also. So, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've spoken with a lot of people of color and uh, I've had a few like uh, Asian folks as well. Tell me about the roles they've, they've gone for. But, uh, you know, in your case, especially what was it like? Because there's just a lot of stereotypes out there. There's a lot of things that might not be super savory that you don't want to do, but it's like, you also need to work. So how did you balance trying to, you know, yeah. stay authentic got, and, and get yeah. work? Well, initially I thought it was very, like I said, blessed, lucky to be working as an actor because I, I never thought that anything like that would happen. Um, I, I always had this in the back of my mind that I'll train myself as an actor here and then maybe I'll go to Bollywood and then and, and be able to find work there. Um, um, but you know, it didn't happen. Uh, so I was lucky enough to get work here. So initially, it was just work. I mean, I, I was working, I was learning, I was feeling blessed, and 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 sort of uh, riding this on this journey. But then there did come come a time that when I got tired of playing these taxi drivers and um, um, Arab terrorists with with, with with this heavy accent, and uh, I, I got frustrated and I did give up. Uh, I think like the mid nineties, there wasn't a lot of work that I did. And I, and then it was, it was basically out of that frustration. I thought I can do better than that. I thought I was a better actor than that. Um, and, but the work just wasn't coming. And I think that's kind of what led me into to producing and, and directing, writing. Uh, and I do a lot of independent stuff and I, you know, a journey to, to Bollywood to direct these Punjabi films. It's, I, I think it's all an extension part of that frustration. Um, to try and do something that I can connect with. That's definitely the biggest thing. I think that's a great choice of words, something to connect with because, yeah. and you are representing it. You know, while you are not an ambassador for the entire Punjab nation, you are representing your people whenever you show up on screen. And uh, that's, that's why having these types of roles go to the right people and being played in a positive way. That's a very important thing to see. Yeah. You know, the, funny that you said that um, um, last night, uh, SAG after I went on strike and Already, I've done this morning uh, two interviews with Punjabi radio station from Canada, and I'm to do another one right after this one. And I'm sure before the week is over, the number of uh, so Punjabi community, the Indian community does have that connect. They do feel that connection towards me. When something like this happens, they do call me and call upon me um, to say a few words. So um, and then then that that gives me a sense of responsibility as well as to what kind of work I do from now on. So last thing, Kavi, before we start talking Trek here, and I feel like we kind of maybe alluded to this just a moment ago here, but you also did an episode of the A-Team back in season three, and yeah. the episode is Moving Targets. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I get the feeling this was a, a terrorist role as well. Am I correct in that? It was. It was a terrorist role. Yeah, it was. Again, it was one of those things. I was still on St. Elsewhere, and um, I had a bit of a break, and this came up. It, and I think I think I worked on it a week or six, seven days, something like that. It was another terrorist role. It was okay. It was money. <laughs> and being on a great show like that, it's a big show. It was just a lot of fun. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, a Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, 
Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section, where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Are you looking for the perfect fashion statement to show you're a geek and proud of it? Well, welcome to Geek Girls Castle, where I make fun and functional geeky clothing and accessories for every occasion. My name is Missy, and I started creating my own gear and apparel in 2015 to bring nerdy products to the geek girl population, which does include all LGBTQA+, non-binary, and POC and BIPOC folks. I couldn't find anything for us gals except t-shirts, so I decided to combine my passion for fashion with my fandoms, ranging from handmade skirts with really large pockets, travel accessories like toiletry bags, luggage tags, and zippered pouches. I also embroider nerdy items for home decor like wall hangings and hand towels, and products like keychains, bookmarks, and journal covers. Need something to carry all that in? Well, I make great bags to put all those accessories into or onto. Whether you like Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, Marvel, DC, and everything else in between, there is something for every geek girl. My website is constantly updated with new styles and fandoms, no matter what time or dimension you come from. If you'd like to browse my products or ask for something custom, visit me at geekgirlscastle.com. That's geekgirlscastle.com. So, Kavi, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion right now. You were Assistant Chief Engineer, Lieutenant Junior Grade Singh. A lot of titles, very little name there. Uh, But you get to show up there in season one of the show, which is really cool. Uh, Let's take this from the top here, Kavi. How did you audition for this role and how did you land this? I had actually initially auditioned for um data really yeah wow yeah, i didn't i didn't get it um and i don't think hollywood was ready for an indian actor to play such a iconic role <laughs> uh I, I i was considered for it i was among the last final two i think brent and i um but I, of course i didn't get it and i think they remembered me from that from that audition they called me in for um a lieutenant singh and uh, it was a very simple audition i remember i just went in read the scene one time and uh, as I walked out, I, th- I believe they called me back again and they asked me if I was available. And that's always a good sign when they ask you that. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so that afternoon I heard from my agent that I got the role. And um, it, it's uh, out of all the work that I've done in Hollywood, this, I think this was one, one of those that will always stand out in my, my, my career as, as being part of this, such an, again, an iconic uh, show that's this it's known worldwide and still talked about 36 years after I did this role. And it was just one episode that I did. And what's really fun here is that this is season one of TNG. This is a whole new world. It's a brave new frontier of sci-fi. And yeah. you know, as we mentioned earlier, you were a fan of it growing up. You were familiar with the show. So for you, you book the gig, but what's it like for you to put on this brand new uniform and see this bridge of the Enterprise? What's the first thing you think about when you see that set? Oh, it was just mind blowing. I mean, I, I, just, just, just being on the set and 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 look at this. I just remember I was just awed. I was, I was just, I, you know, as an actor, you especially when you're on a, on a show as a guest star, um, everyone else is so used to it, and you're trying to fit in for that day or the number of days that you're working on it, um, and you're always, you're all already a little bit nervous. But just looking at my strony made me even more nervous. And it was like, oh, am I gonna be able to go through, you know, get through the date? Uh, but it just the whole thing was a wonderful experience. A great actress again to work with. Um, it was just one of those memorable experiences that I may not remember all the details, but but just the, the my presence there, being there, 
um, I will always remember. Well, I'm going to try and poke and prod and see if I can refresh any memories today. We'll see what we, we uh, come up with. But I'd love to see if you remember anything about the uniform itself. Because I feel like season one, it's pretty memorable. They're very different from how they've gone the rest of the series. Yeah. Uh, and I've heard not necessarily great things about how they felt to wear. Do you remember anything about that uniform? I remember the wardrobe department putting on the uniform. And and um, um, and I, I, of course, I don't remember the name of the uh, the the person that I was working with. And, and and when I put that on, she said, good to see that you're still in pretty good shape. Because she said, I still remember this. She said, but this uniform doesn't look good if there's a little bit of a punch. <laughs> it, you have to be really fit to put this on. And, and I was in decent shape at that time, I think. Um, but it, it just it just puts you in a whole different environment when you put the uniform on. And it wasn't the most comfortable uniform, from what I remember. <laughs> uh, but it does make you feel like, oh, this is something special. Now, your major scene in this episode here is side by side with Jonathan Frakes while speaking yeah. with Patrick Stewart and you're being observed by Brent Spiner. You got yeah. the heavy hitters all in the same room with you. Uh, do you have any memories of working with them? No wrecking. <laughs> yeah, all these heavyweights and um, uh, amazing actors. Um, it was just, yeah. But I think I pulled it off. I think it was okay. <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing here is that it's also, you know, it's still the first season. It's it's definitely a few episodes into the first season, but they're still trying to like find their way. And I'm curious if you kind of remember any of the feeling on the set, like, you know, because again, this is first season. People are trying to get to know each other still. It's not going to be like season seven where they're all joking. Uh, do you have any recollection right. of just the environment itself? I, I do remember there wasn't a lot of, like you, like you said, there wasn't a lot of uh, talking among actors, connecting with each other. Uh, I, I, there's a little bit of an isolation type of a thing. You're so right on 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 a, on a show like that, or any show as a series, it takes a little time for actors to get used to each other and, and make that connection where they get, they're so comfortable in the environment, in their roles, that there is a lot of joking around and and, and they jump, jump right in, say their lines, and then they're out of it, and then, talking about something else. And I think here, they were still starting to focus on their roles. Um, and then there's a lot of this technical jargon, I think, kind of throws you off a little bit. You really need to focus on that. Otherwise, it, it doesn't flow as naturally as it was, you know, um, a comedy or a drama. I mean, I feel like the role of uh, Singh, though, is very much kismet for you because, you know, you were an engineer. Now you're playing an engineer and you got to say all yeah. the techno babble. So it feels like this is kind of like the perfect role for you. It, it was, yeah, <laughs> and and I um in real even though my name is Kavi Raz, I actually am a Singh. Really? I come from a Sikh family. Uh, my father, my father wore wore a turban and a, and a long beard, and he was a he was a proper baptized Sikh, and that's my background. And my my dad was really proud of that that I actually played a Singh. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Now, your other main scene in this episode, too, we should add, is you get to have a very big death scene. You get electrocuted to death. The warp yeah, finds no. your body. Uh, my question here is, was that you actually doing that fall by the warp core? I, you know, this is I can't remember that now. Huh. Wow. I think I did. Yeah. That was actually you fought, taking the fall. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it was me. Yeah. And how fun is it to get to do a death scene in Star Trek also? I mean, that's a pretty cool oh, thing. Oh, man. <laughs> But the whole effects and stuff were done later on, of course. But of course, um, yeah. You mean it's not yeah. real? What are, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's Star Trek. Yeah, it could be real. Um, yeah, um, I, I don't. I don't remember a lot of the details uh, of that particular shoot. But yeah, just just I, I believe the first engineer ever killed on the star. <laughs> well, that's a record to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, your character does not make it out alive, which is pretty disappointing. Uh, yeah. But I'm curious, after this, did you audition for any other roles in the Star Trek franchise? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I think they have a policy if 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 there's a, you play a character that's as as uh, stand out as as uh, uh, Lieutenant Singh was, they, they don't want to bring you back from doing something else. I have done other shows where I played different characters um, and with a couple of years of gap in there. But I think this this may not have worked, hmm. and, okay. and I'm glad it kind of just stayed with this one character, one episode, because the attention it gets is pretty amazing. Yeah, and just kind of go on the topic here of Star Trek and and the politics of Star Trek as well. You know, it's always viewed as a very progressive show, but 
the one interesting thing about it is if you really look at it, you know, there's not really a lot of like Asian folks or Pacific Islanders and, and especially Indian actors as well. You don't really see a ton of them in Star Trek. And, you know, shameless plug, there's another great show out there called All the Asians in Star Trek, which kinds of uh, kind of addresses this. But, uh, you yeah. know, I've noticed like a lot of Indian Middle Eastern actors you really don't see in Star Trek. Uh, very few Latino actors as well. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of interesting that for whatever reason, sci-fi has kind of forgotten about them. And I don't know if you have any insight on into this, but uh, I'm curious, like, does the Indian culture have any sort of sci-fi connection? Well, um, I think if you really think about it, there should be more of, uh, South Asian Indian actors or characters on shows, sci-fi shows, because there are a lot of Indian engineers, scientists, um, um, techno thinkers, quite a few. I mean, if you take look at the percentage, but probably a high percentage uh, of Indian South Asian scientists out there. Uh, it just makes logical sense to have more South Asian Indian characters on sci-fi shows. There should be more, um, as well as other um, communities as well, representation as well. Um, it makes it more of a complete world uh, that we live in now to, to see different types of characters on sci-fi shows. It, I, think, I think it will relate to more people um, it would expand our audience um, uh, connections or connectability as well if you had different characters. Yeah, as a more homo homogeneous sort of a world, uh, the more representative of the world that we live in. Yeah, I agree with that. And yeah, I think back to other countries as well and their forms of media. And, you know, we have like in Japan anime, which has a very heavy sci fi, cyberpunk influence throughout it and still to this day has a lot of that. You can look yeah. at Afrofuturism and a lot of people of color who have sci fi, but I think about like Indian movies and the first thing I think about is unfortunately like, you know, Bollywood or very heavy dramas. I don't really think sci-fi. I mean, you know, in India, do they actually have sci-fi as a genre? Is it something that people are interested in? That's interesting. Actually, they don't. Uh, I think um, a couple of directors tried this in the past and it just didn't work. For some reason, the Indian audience, that Bollywood audience doesn't quite connect with sci-fi. That's yeah. so strange. Um there the a lot of action films we made, you know, like RRR was yeah. <laughs> a huge success worldwide and uh, there's a number of other films coming up um, for sci-fi. Uh, and I think it's natural for, 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 for Bollywood to do more of sci-fi. Uh, they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, the, uh, when, you, when you look at the, the ancient texts of India, the Vedas and the Maya, there's always this connection made that they, this, these were aliens that came from another planet. Uh, why not play with that and have some fun with it and see what happens? Yeah. yeah. Now, we should add, too, that you have another Star Trek connection on your resume, and that's through Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, which also starred Denise Crosby. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if you had any time uh, working with her. I know you had a pretty pretty big role in that also, right? Uh, do you remember any any time working with or hanging out with Denise Crosby? I I don't. I mean, I, 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 I remember being in Maine, uh, shooting for that. I was actually, this, this is so funny, I almost didn't do that. Really? No, I, I was building my home um, here in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I'm actually sitting in that place right now. I, I turned this home into my studio now. So, because I, I, we built it. My, my wife's an architect, so we, we build homes, wow. <laughs> custom homes. So I was building this home. I was so much into it that I got a call to do this. Uh, to best me. I didn't have to audition for it. They just called me. My agent called, and I was sitting in my, my trailer on top of the hill and and I had a phone in there. So I got, got my, this call from my agent saying they want you in Maine at the following morning or the morning after I think it was. And I'm debating and we were pouring our foundation that morning. So, and I was supervising them myself <laughs> and I'm, I'm debating, shall I pour the foundation? Or shall I go and do this and be out there for 10 days? <laughs> um, then a friend of mine was jogging by and and I saw him and I, I called him. I said, come, come, come here, come here. I, and he was someone who had kind of like been with me on this, this journey in, in Hollywood as an actor. He was studying directing and he gave up and couldn't really do anything. And he went into a different direction. But anyway, he was jogging by that at that particular moment. I called him and I asked him, I said, what would you do if you were in this dilemma? He said, I would go and do the show. I would go and do the film. And <laughs> so that's how I heard that. So I called my agent back, said, I'm going to do this. And I think it was two days later I ended up in Maine. And um, I, and I don't have, uh, this was, that was, that was 80, 88, I think it was. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I don't have too many memories of 
being on the set. Uh, but I do remember watching the film. I, I think the screening was at, um, I think it was at 20th Century Fox. Uh, and I took my wife to the screening and it was pretty scary watching it all put together, <laughs> which you don't get while you're shooting it. You don't quite get that how it's going to look. Um, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was quite an experience, quite an experience. And I till this day, I watch bits and pieces of it. Yeah, and that one every song somewhere. And I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely does hold up. Yeah. 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 Now, you know, I've had a lot of uh, guests in the show where we've talked about this kind of similar topic, and we've been kind of dipping our toes in, into it today. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm thinking back to my interview I had with Clyde Kasatsu, and he would tell me how he'd go on to audition at things, and he'd yeah. see like the same group of Asian actors each time auditioning for the same Asian role. Yeah. And again, I'm thinking about like Indian actors. I can only think off the top of my head of Brian George and and you. Yeah, I'm like, trying to think like, you know, it's a very small community, isn't it? So, I mean, it uh, is. how, how small is it and has it grown, do you think? You know, uh, there was a, um, um, it, it was pretty small. It has grown a lot. And I don't know a lot of the new actors, uh, unfortunately. But, and, and because of COVID and stuff and the whole audition process has changed. It's all, yeah. you know, you tape yourself and send it in, which is, is it saves you a lot of time. But I don't like it at the same time because when we actually went in an audition, it was an opportunity to meet some of these these actors, even though you're vying for the same role, but it's fun to just hang out. And we would sometimes we would be all focusing on our, our audition and we would say, no, wait for me, you know. Uh, and then we'll hang out outside, have a cup of coffee or something. Uh, we connected. And but now all of that connection is gone. It was a pretty small community. Uh, Clyde, you mentioned, um, I I didn't I didn't see him, but we just did a film together last summer. Oh really? Uh, Which one was that? Sight. Sight. It's a it's a sci-fi horror type of genre. Um, and Kai's in it and myself. And this is with Jake McLaughlin and Theo Rossi. Um, yeah, these guys. It, that, was, that was a lot of fun, actually, shooting that film. Well, very was... cool. Shout out to Clyde and make sure everybody uh, listening, check out site. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey everybody, we'll get right back to the interview in one second, but I wanted to remind you all to check out Trek Untold over at Patreon. Patreon is the best way to directly support creators of things you like through a monthly subscription of an amount that you can choose. Trek Untold has a few different tiers already with different benefits, ranging from early access to episodes, the ability to ask a future guest questions, exclusive merchandise, and other bonuses that I'd love to offer, but first I need to grow that Patreon community to do that. Trek Untold has been around since mid-2020 and has grown a ton since then, thanks to listeners and viewers like you. Through a platform like Patreon, you can help me keep improving the quality of each episode and keep bringing you new interviews with folks that make the Star Trek universe what it is. If this community can grow more over on Patreon, I can offer new perks like watch parties, exclusive Trek Untold episodes, being able to directly interact with guests, and other things, but in order to do that, I need to know my audience wants these things. The best way to tell me what you want is by supporting us on Patreon. So please check us out at patreon.com slash Trek Untold today and become a bigger part of the Trek Untold family. And now back to the interview. So, you know, I want to talk about something also beyond the roles here. And we've been alluding to this also throughout this interview here. Uh, you know, you are a very entrepreneurial man and you started your own studio. And I'd love yeah. to hear about what was the impetus for that and what you guys are doing today. Um, so I, yeah, I started my own studio, my own production company, and um, um, it um, and I started producing films, independent films, uh, 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 not huge budgets, but something that I was able to put together. And I've produced a number of films. I have two feature films um, that I completed just prior to COVID, and I'm releasing them now. One coming out in November, early November. The other one coming out in February. So this whole studio journey has led to something quite amazing that during COVID, I came up with this crazy idea of starting my own streaming platform, and which we just went live a couple of months ago. A month ago. It's a, and it kind of answers everything that we have been talking about so far. Uh, I thought there was nothing out there that catered to just the South Asian content south asian community worldwide where when you go on you see a bunch of south asian content world cinema that no one else is paying attention to so my streaming platform is called cpix.tv c the letter c p i c s dot tv and all of the content on it is south asian 
relatable. We have we have some some films on there which which are represented of world cinema films curated from across the world from various nations, uh, Persian cinema, Tur Turkish cinema, that kind of stuff. But we ourselves are producing a lot of original content, reality shows, scripted shows. Last year I did. Um, uh, to date, we started production at the beginning of last year. To date, we have uh, we have produced about twenty six or twenty seven series, ten episodes each, kind of thing, which we now are starting to drop on this uh, platform. Our first show goes up on uh, July twenty ninth, and it's a reality show, sort of like the Housewives of Beverly Hills. We have our own version of it uh, called Gems of Ruby Hill. Uh, Ruby Hill is a is a is this this gated community in uh, in Livermore by in the, basically in the Silicon Valley where all these techies, wealthy billionaires, millionaires, South Asians live. And this is their story. So that's that's what this building my own studio, my own production company has now led to. And how about this is CPEX. <laughs> we build these, made these little uh, uh, cards that anyone can, you know, snap the, the phone on and go to our site and subscribe. That's really cool. That's that's yeah. so cool. I mean, you have such a serious burning entrepreneurial spirit in you. And I love <laughs> what you've done with that. You've really just like taken yourself from one spot and got yourself somewhere else completely different. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, this journey. Yeah, Matthew, I, I and I have no business sense to be, to be quite honest. I'm not really a typical businessman. I don't come from a business family. I come from, a, well, I mean, if I, if I relate all the way back to our, our journey back in India from a farming community. Yeah. And my father was a farmer and a soldier. And um, and when we first came to the United States, that's what we did. I worked on the farms, picking fruit for three years, along with my family. My my sister owned, uh, she, she still has own, uh, her father-in-law and her own standard new family owned orchards, peach orchards. And that's, that was a sort of a comfortable place for us to just work in because it was such a natural part of who we were. And here I am, uh, trying to be a businessman. <laughs> Well, I think mission accomplished. I think you're definitely doing it. And uh, yeah, yeah. for my audience today, for someone who knows like nothing about your work, or some, someone who doesn't really know a ton about CPIX yet, what's the first movie that they should watch that you've been involved in as a producer or director and that's on this platform uh, that you're most proud of? Uh, I have two films coming up. I have this film um, that first will be releasing theatrically in February, but then it'll be on CPIX. It's called Barefoot Warriors. It's a film about soccer. And I shot this film in India. Uh, Sean Ferris is in it. Um, and Rajpal Yadav, who's a, a Bollywood actor, and myself. And I, I, um, I shot this film just prior to COVID in India. Uh, it's about soccer. It's, 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 it relates to um, India had just gotten its independence from England. And in the 1948 Olympics, um, they are invited, of course, uh, as a free nation. So they, they, they feel this soccer team, a football team, uh, is playing in England, in London, in, uh, and they're playing against France in front of their imperial rulers as a free nation wearing the colors of their own nation, probably playing against France. They lost the match um, um, by one goal, but they missed two penalties. Uh, had they scored those two penalties, they would have beaten France, which was a powerhouse at that time. And but India, Indian players are so appreciated. It was a standing ovation for them as they went off the field. Um, but the, 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 the wonderful thing, or the, or the amazing thing about it, the, the, the players played barefoot. Indian team at that time wasn't used to playing with shoes and couldn't really afford to train and play in shoes because India was a, a new nation um, having just broken the shackles of, of British rule, of 400 years of British rule, basically. And um, uh, so this film has its roots in that match, but it's a contemporary story. Uh, and I think it's a film that's worth watching. And when it drops on CPIX, I would love people to tune in and watch it. That's like one of those cases where like real life is better than fiction, because that's like such a dramatic story, the way you're telling me that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it was a fun film to shoot as well. And I also heard of something I think you did a few years ago called the Gold Bracelet, which I believe was a pretty popular role oh, that you worked on, yeah. right? Yeah, Gold Bracelet. Okay, yeah, that's that's uh, one of those passion projects that I did a few years ago. Unfortunately, I could never get a release. And I think, again, um, um, CPIX is sort of a, an extension of that, 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 that sort of disappointment, that dis you know, disheartenment that I, I made these, I, what I thought was a wonderful film, I couldn't release it. Um, 
that also will drop on on on, on CPEX at, at at some point in the very near future. A lot of people do watch that film. I, I think uh, um, it, even today that film is very relatable. Um, everything that we see happening around us, uh, that film addresses a lot of uh, um, kind of the world that we live in. And, and for those who don't know what the gold bracelet's about, what's the uh, elevator pitch for that story? Uh, it's uh, it's it's an on, set around 9-11. Um, uh, it was inspired by a true event that happened in Arizona. A sick uh, gas station owner was killed, shot right in front of his station. Um, um, the killer thinking that he was a, an Arab, a Muslim. And um, so the film was inspired by that story. It's a... Um, it's 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 it's, it's, it's it, I mean that's a very heavy subject, but the film itself is not so heavy. I mean it has other stuff happening in it, which I wouldn't really love a lot of people who watch it. Um, and a lot of that is still going on. Uh, six um, as a community has suffered a lot um, uh, from this type of discrimination, and um, there was a another incident that happened years later in Wisconsin. Uh, where a Sikh temple was attacked and six people were killed. Again, the killer thinking he was hitting a mosque, Muslim, which is uh, absolutely un un unacceptable. Un you know, um, even as a Sikh community, we always say, um, yes, we are being marginalized, we are suffering, but no one should suffer, whether it's Muslims or Sikhs or Jews or, or whatever minority. We stand up for the rights of all. And um, uh, then that's something that a world needs to think and hopefully change. And there's a lot of amazing stories out there that really don't get the platform to be told. And so I'm happy yeah. that you're doing this and bringing some attention to these issues and doing them in a really, really great way. Yeah. And we should add to that, Kavi, you're writing and you're directing many of these, and you're also acting in some of these too. Uh, <laughs> what's it like for you to wear so many hats in the production pipeline? Very difficult. Um, I can I imagine. Guess, yeah, I guess as I, as I get older, it's, it's, it's acting part is becoming a little difficult, directing and acting myself, uh, directing myself. Uh, so I'm doing less and less of that. Um, I did do Barefoot Warriors and then another film called Saraba, which is a, a film that I made in in the Punjabi language. Um, and that's another wonderful film that people need to watch. Uh, it's, it's very relatable to us here in America. Part of the story actually takes place here. It's a period film. Um, India owes, I think, a part of his, his independence movement to the USA, because that film, Saraba, is about that, how India's independence movement actually started right here in California. Uh, and uh, that film answers that. Uh, um, as to how it how it happened, how that journey began. Um, yeah, uh, I I think in my own small way, I'm trying to tell a lot of these stories that needs to be told and that no one else is telling. So, Kavi, it's time for the lightning round here on Trek Untold, which is where I ask questions that I think are going to be very short and simple, but they're always way more complicated. Uh -huh. uh, so let's start things off here with best day you've ever had working on a set somewhere and the worst day you've ever had on a set somewhere. That's a tough one because I have I have a lot of best days. Um, I think Mash, it was just a lot of fun. Um, all the actors were. I think and they were winding down in the the series. They knew this was the last one, third third from the last episode of of the life of this series, and there was just a lot of camaraderie, a lot of fun, a lot of just enjoying themselves. And I and I was it was very welcoming sort of a set. I remember that. I would say the worst day, but the most un uncomfortable day was probably uh, it was the it was the, it was a, it was a show that we mentioned earlier on <laughs> uh, where I played a terrorist. The set was uncomfortable. There were too many egos on that set. I think too many stars, too many egos, and and that sometimes permeates in in the crew as well. And the crew are so under pressure to treat those stars well that they forget about the, the guest stars. And the guest stars don't get treated as well, or or even not treated at all, so to speak. And I remember that from that particular set. Oh, oh and then then what happened? This is so so funny because I, since since you mentioned that, and I was feeling very uncomfortable, and because one of the the eighties was not just being disrespectful, he was just totally ignoring me. And then another eighty came on the set who had known me from St. Elsewhere. 
And he suddenly, he took that guy, because he was watching, I guess, from a distance. He took that guy aside and told him, do you know who that is? And then things changed a little bit, but it was still not the best experience of my 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 working sort of life. <laughs> but the good thing about those bad experiences is it does help inform you now with what you're doing. It's like, you know, here's what not to do. So I know what Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I treat um, uh, my actor, my everybody, crew, actors, uh, with utmost respect and if somebody doesn't fit in uh, and that happens sometimes we just politely ask them hey if you're not comfortable here um, it's okay <laughs> you can you can leave uh, <laughs> but actors being an actor I, I understand the actors difficulties and dilemmas and and I, I treat them with, with utmost love and respect and actors I think uh, in general love working with me well how about this one Kavi most challenging role that you ever had that was ultimately the most rewarding? Uh, I, th I think I just did that on this film site. It was challenging. Um, I had all this heavy makeup and stuff that I had to wear. And um, um, also um, the dollar was very technical. Um, it was, it sometimes the dollar just flows. It, it was written really, really well, but it didn't have that flow because of the, the technical jargon. And uh, the first day I had, a, I had a really like a tight packed schedule where I had a lot of dialogue. So I was thinking, having a bit of a difficulty with that, but I, everyone else was so supportive. And, uh, but then it became so comfortable that after I had so much fun doing this film, a film called Sight. Uh, I, how I look um, in the end, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't <laughs> seen the final edit yet, yet. I think it's, it's gonna look pretty amazing. And I'll, I'll give it my vote of confidence. If it's got you and Clyde in it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clyde, Clyde's a, a legend. Yeah, it was, he really it was, is. It was, to see his name, actually, he's in, in the makeup room, he's, he's, he's photographed on the wall there. I'm like, wow, <laughs> I'm going to be the same film with Clyde. That's great. <laughs> right, right. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about most memorable piece of advice that you ever received from somebody that you still think about today? You know, I always say this, Denzel Washington on, on St. Elsewhere, because he was he was doing other things as well. He would go off and do a film and, um, and, and come back to St. Elsewhere again. Um, and and we're talking on the set one day. He probably won't even remember this, but, and and I, I, I must have asked him, I said, well, how, how are you able to do all this? He's, he's, he said, well, when something comes on my way, I never say no to it. I just accept it. And you can always, this gives you time to think about it if you really want to do it. Um, and I think that's, that's part of his, his, his sort of uh, his, his mindset. That, and I, th I think that was, a, that was a good piece of advice because I see that in a lot of actors, young actors, uh, something comes our way and no matter how small or big it is, they think about it. They say, oh, no, I don't want to do this. Or I don't want to do an union. I want to be in a certain career path. And I, I, I think that's not really very productive or uh, um, I think, in, especially in the beginning, I remember one of my teachers, acting teachers also telling us, do student films, do whatever comes your way, do stay, learn. You, once you have grown and a certain status in your career, you can always then start thinking about what kind of stuff you wanna do. But initially don't turn things down. Just, just be active, do, 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 you know, as a player, play, as an actor, act. And those are some of the devices I remember, and I kind of carry those with me till this day. Uh, I, I get things offered to me, which uh, sometimes are may not be the best, but I never say no right away. Uh, so let me, yeah, okay, I'll consider this, I think. And sometimes I end up doing stuff because I'm not doing anything else. I have time on my hand, I'll go and do it. it I'll, it's a day or two days, uh, I'll work. I'm an actor, I need to stay active. Now, we had this thread dangling throughout the entire interview, I think, and we talked about how you were essentially an engineer before you got into acting. So yeah. how did your engineering background inform your choices as an actor? Did it help you? Did it hinder you? Did it offer anything for you? I think it, it initially it hindered me uh, because I had this this almost like a, um, analytical sort of thinking uh, approach. And, and I remember one of my teachers again telling me that I have to let go of that. Uh, and acting is not, you cannot analyze, you cannot analytically do something. It's, it's behavior, it's human behavior. It's, it's, it's recreating something that cannot, yes, planned, but it not, cannot be played planned. 
Um, so I had to re, re unlearn that part of me. And um, yeah. so, yeah, and then, then and let go of that, that I can just analytically plan something and then execute it in such a way. Uh, I, have, I, let, I have to let nature take its course as well. And, um, and I, I think um, hopefully it made me a better actor understanding that and knowing that and being pointed out very early on in my career. Last question now, Kavi. What's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Just look at it. 36 years later, we're still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. And I, I think it's going to live on forever. Uh, um, beyond my life and uh, that's I think that's just an amazing amazing legacy to in such a small way be part of something so big so so vast um, yeah I'm, I, I tell my my, my, my my daughters are proud of it and uh, one of my daughters got married recently hope she, you know, she'll have kids soon I and I'll be able to tell my grandchildren that, hey, I was on Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And Kavi, you know, I, I love hearing your story. I, I always enjoy hearing the stories like that, where someone starts on the other side of the world, and they work their way into Hollywood. And not just that, you did that, you accomplished that part of the journey. Then you launched into your C picks as well now and, and became a director, a producer, all these other things. I mean, you've had quite a trip from a little boy growing up in rural Indian farm through the UK here in America now. Uh, so, number one, just congratulations. I wish you the most success possible you can have on CPix. Everybody check out cpix.tv. And again, thank you so much for joining us today here on Trek Untold and for sharing all your great stories. Matthew, thank you so much for having me. It's the most wonderful pleasure. And uh, good luck to you too as, as, as well on Trek Untold. Thank you. you you got to live long and prosper there, friend. <laughs> thank you. God bless you. Thank you. That's it for this week's show. Thanks again for checking out Trek Untold. If you aren't already, please follow Trek Untold on social media, where you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, among others, all at Trek Untold. Don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube for the video versions of this show at youtube.com slash at Trek Untold, and subscribe to us on whatever platform you're listening to the audio version on. We always appreciate likes, shares, comments, thumbs up, ratings, and reviews, and whatever you can do to help spread the word about this podcast and inform other Trekkies about why they need to check this show out. If you're able to financially support this show, visit patreon.com slash trekuntold to learn about the different ways you can contribute to keeping this show going full speed ahead. Shout out to Scott Ray for bringing us this week's guest. If you'd like to book them for an autograph signing or a personal appearance at a convention, Email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz. This has been Trek Untold. And remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms. Is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.